Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some Jury Charge. Ready? Here we go. It is not required, however, that the government prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based on reason and common sense, but not one based purely on speculation or guesswork. A reasonable doubt may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all of the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after careful and impartial consideration of all of the evidence at the end of the case, you are not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the government has proved a particular defendant guilty of a particular charge, it is your duty to find that defendant not guilty of that charge. On the other hand, if after such careful and impartial consideration of all of the evidence, you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the government has proved a particular defendant is guilty of a particular charge. It is your duty to find that defendant guilty of that charge. In deciding whether the government has proved any of the defendants guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of any of the charges, you must not consider what sentence or punishment the court may impose in the event you find the defendant guilty of any charge. In deciding the facts, you may consider only the evidence received in the case, which consists of one, the sworn testimony of each witness, two, the exhibits which have been received into evidence and which will be with you in the jury room, and three, any agreed facts that have been pointed out to you. The following things are not evidence, and you may not consider them in deciding what the facts are. One, arguments, statements, and questions by the lawyers or by the self Represented parties, defendants Ryan Bundy, Shauna Cox, and Kenneth Mendenbach are not evidence. The lawyers, land, and the self-represented parties, when they speak other than under oath from the witness stand, are not speaking as witnesses, although you must consider their questions to understand the answers of a witness and thus to evaluate the witness's testimony as a whole. The questions themselves are not evidence. Similarly, what the lawyers and the self-represented parties say in their opening statements, closing arguments, and at other times not from the witness stand is intended to help you interpret the evidence, but it is not evidence. If you remember the evidence differently from how they describe it, your memory of the evidence controls. Two, objections by the lawyers and the self-represented parties are not evidence. They may raise an objection when... They believe a question or a witness's answer is improper under the rules of evidence or the court's previous rulings. Remember not to concern yourself with why an objection is made. Instead, simply follow any, my ruling about the objection. If I overrule the objection, the question may be answered and the answer is an evidence for you to consider. If I sustain an object, objection, you must disregard the question and any part of the answer you may have heard. It is not evidence. 3. Testimony or any other matter that I tell you to disregard is not evidence, and you must not consider it in your deliberations. 4. Finally, anything you may see or hear when court is not in session is not evidence. This is true, even if what you see or hear out of court is about the case or is said or done by someone connected with the case. Remember, you must decide the case solely on the evidence received during the trial and on the court's instructions of law. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is the direct proof of a fact such as the testimony of an eyewitness about what the witness personally saw or heard or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence that is proof of one or more facts from which you could find that another fact exists even though the other fact has not been proved directly. The law does not prefer one kind of evidence over the other. You should consider both kinds of evidence and then decide how much weight to give to any particular piece of evidence. There may be times during the trial when some evidence is received from for a limited purpose only, and I instruct you about the limited way you may consider each such item of evidence. As you deliberate, you must follow all limiting instructions I give you during the trial, and you must consider any evidence which is admitted for a limited purpose only for that limited purpose and not for any other purpose. In deciding the facts in this case, you may have to decide which testimony to believe and which testimony not to believe. You may believe everything a witness says, or part of it, or none of it. In considering the testimony of any witness, you may take into account, one, the opportunity and ability of the witness to see or to hear or to know the things testified to. 
to the witness's memory, three, the witness's manner while testifying, four, the witness's interest in the outcome of the case and whether the witness has any bias or prejudice, five, whether other evidence, including earlier statements by the witness, contradicted the witness's testimony, six, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony in light of all the evidence, and seven, any other factors you find bear on the believability of a witness, including whether any witness has previously been convicted of a felony crime. A defendant in a criminal case has a constitutional right not to testify. You may not draw any inference of any kind from the fact that one or more defendants chooses not to testify. On the other hand, although a defendant in a criminal case has a constitutional right not to testify, a defendant may waive that right and choose to testify. You should evaluate the testimony of any defendant who chooses to testify in the same manner as you evaluate the testimony of all of the other witnesses. A defendant in a criminal case has a constitutional right to self-representation, and defendants Ryan Bundy, Shauna Cox, and Kenneth Medenbach have chosen to represent themselves in this trial with the services of a standby lawyer to assist each of them. The decisions of these defendants to represent themselves have no bearing on whether he or she is guilty or not guilty and must not affect your consideration of the case. You are here only to determine whether each defendant is guilty or not guilty of the particular charges at issue and your determination must be made only from the evidence in the case. The defendants are not on trial for any other conduct or offense. You may hear testimony or other evidence that one or more defendants made certain statements. It is not it is for you to decide, one, whether any defendant or defendants made a particular statement, two, if so, the meaning of such statements in the context of all the evidence, and three, how much weight you should give to evidence about such statement. In making those decisions, you should consider all of the evidence about the statement, including the circumstances under which the defendant or defendants may have made it. You may hear testimony of eyewitness identification in deciding how much weight to give to such testimony. You may consider the factors already stated in these instructions as to evaluating witness testimony. In addition, in evaluating eyewitness identification testimony, you may also consider, one, the capacity and opportunity of the eyewitness to make observations based upon the conditions at the particular time the eyewitness made the identification, including lighting distance and length of time to observe, two, whether the identification was the product of the eyewitness own, eyewitness's own recollection or was the result of subsequent influence or suggestiveness. All right, we will stop there and excuse me for a moment. We will stop get back to this jury charge at another time and now let's try some literary practice let's see what we have here this is called peace of mind for renters what renter's insurance covers and doesn't. Ready? Here we go. If you recently rented an apartment or house, you may have been surprised by one thing that your landlord requires proof of renter's insurance. It's not uncommon these days, but it might feel like one more annoying and expensive task on your to-do list. Actually, most people are pleasantly surprised by the low premiums for renter's insurance, even more so when they sign up with their auto insurer and get a multi-policy discount. Renter's insurance protects both renters and landlords. For example, if a tenant who has renter's insurance causes damage to a unit, the renter's insurance may cover the cost of repairs. 
However, if the tenant doesn't have renter's insurance and cannot or won't pay for repairs, the landlord may have to pay and then sue the tenant for reimbursement, costing him time and legal fees. Another benefit of renter's insurance is that it helps to identify where coverage applies, reducing disputes between landlords and tenants. That's why it's important for renters to know what their policy covers and doesn't cover. Your landlord has a policy on the building you live in, but it covers only the structure, not your belongings. That's where renter's insurance comes in. It helps cover the cost of replacing your things if they're stolen or ruined due to covered perils, such as a fire or theft. Some companies offer replacement cost options that may require an endorsement on your policy. Without replacement cost coverage, your personal property may be covered only up to its current value, which is depicted based on its age and its condition and not the full amount needed to replace it. This type of coverage included in most renters policies protects you, protects you if someone gets hurt in your home or apartment. Your insurer will investigate the claim and when appropriate provide legal counsel in the event of a covered loss. If you are found liable, the company will pay damages owed up to the policy's coverage limits. This coverage even protects you away from your home. Say you're pushing your shopping cart at the grocery store and you accidentally hit another shopper with your cart. She falls and is injured. If you are found to be liable, your renter's insurance will typically cover you in any resulting claim for the injury. Rental, renter's insurance generally pays for expenses above your normal living costs if you cannot use all or part of your rental due to unexpected damage. That includes alternate lodging costs and increased food expenses if you must move out while the unit is being repaired. Most rental insurance policies place a cap on how much they'll pay if certain items are stolen, such as jewelry, cash and coins, silverware, firearms, rugs, and tools. For example, many insurers put a $1,500 limit on jewelry theft claims. If you have certain belongings that are particularly valuable, tell your insurance agent about them. Most companies can provide additional coverage for those items at a relatively low cost. If you own expensive items that a flood or earthquake could destroy, or you live in an area where these natural disasters are a danger, you might want to consider purchasing separate flood or earthquake insurance. Ask your agent how to get the proper coverage in your area. Excuse me once again. All right. Now we'll get back to some jury charge practice. And this is a jury charge we have been working on. It wasn't the one we were doing just a few minutes ago. It's a different one. But you should be familiar. We've been working on this one. All right, here we go. The third element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant caused the physical injury by means of a dangerous instrument, namely a baseball bat, and not by means of the discharge of a firearm. A dangerous instrument means any instrument or article which under the circumstances in which it is used it is capable of causing death or serious physical injury. Serious physical injury means physical injury which creates a substantial risk of death or which causes serious disfigurement, serious impairment of health, or serious loss of impairment of the function of any bodily organ. The instrument or article need not be inherently dangerous. All that is required is that it was capable of causing death or serious physical injury under the circumstances in which it was used. Any article, even though harmless under normal use, may be found to be a dangerous instrument if under the circumstances of its use it was capable of producing death or serious physical injury. If you find that the state has proven each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty as charged. If you find that the state has failed to prove one or more elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. When you go into the jury room to deliberate upon the evidence in this case, each of you should ask this question with respect to each count of the information. Has the state proven the charge alleged in that count beyond a reasonable doubt? 
if you find, after a consideration of all of the evidence in light of my instruction that the state has met this burden, you must deliver a verdict of guilty on that count. If you find that the state has failed to meet this burden, you must deliver a verdict of not guilty on that count. Your first duty when you go into the jury room will be to select a four-person. After you have selected a four-person and received the information and exhibits from the clerk, you will begin your deliberations. We will take the usual lunch break between 1 and 2 p.m. If you wish to take other breaks, such as coffee breaks at other times, you are free to do so. Be sure that the clerk or marshal knows the anticipated length of your break. Because the court is unable to pay the court personnel over time, your deliberations cannot continue past 5 p.m. No one will hurry you to reach a verdict. If you do not have a verdict by 5 p.m. on any given day, you will simply be brought back the next day to resume your deliberations. You are permitted to deliberate only in the jury room when all 12 of you are present. If one or more jurors are not present for any reason, you may not discuss the case. You must wait until all 12 of you are present. The rule is important. If it is violated, we may have to try the case all over again. If you have a question during your deliberation, the four person should write the question down on a sheet of paper, sign and date it, and knock on the door. The marshal will then bring the question to me and I will answer it in open court. It may take a few minutes to assemble the staff before you are brought into the courtroom to hear the response. Please try to make any question very precise. We cannot engage in an informal dialogue, and I will respond only to your written question. If you need to have any testimony or any part of my instructions read back, follow the same procedure. Write on a sheet of paper what it is you want to hear as precisely as you can. For example, if you want to hear only the direct examination or the cross-examination of a particular witness, please say so. Otherwise, we may have to read the whole testimony. Your verdict must be unanimous as to each count. All 12 of you must agree on the verdict as a check that your verdict is in fact unanimous. The clerk may ask each of you to individually announce your verdict in open court. Each of you has taken an oath to deliver a true verdict according to the evidence. No one must be false to that oath, but you have a duty not only as individuals but also collectively. That is the strength of the jury system. Each of you takes into the jury box and the deliberation room your individual experience and wisdom. Your task is to pool that experience and wisdom. You do that by giving your views and listening to the views of others. There must be, there must necessarily be discussion, argument, and give and take within the scope of your oath. That is why in which that is the way in which a unanimous verdict is reached. When you reach your verdict, knock on the door and inform the marshal or clerk of that fact. Do not tell the court personnel what your verdict is. You will be brought into open court to deliver your ver verdict. It may take several minutes to assemble the necessary court personnel. You will be asked by the clerk whether you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of the crime charged in the first count of the information. The foreperson will announce your verdict in open court. The clerk will then proceed to the remaining counts of the information. You should not expect me to make any comment on your verdict. It has been my task to rule on issues of evidence and to instruct you on the law. It is your task to decide the case and I will leave that strictly up to you and make no comment on what you decide. It is, of course, merely the division of duties and not any lack of appreciation of your efforts that keeps me from commenting on your decision. All right, that's it for that particular jury charge. in the way of a little more literary practice.
this is called New Views. Carnival Vista sets a fresh course. Ready? Here we go. Departing from earlier concepts that often directed passengers' attention toward ship interiors, Carnival Cruise Line's Carnival Vista reflects a new approach for the line. We really want our guests to know they are on the ocean, Christine Duffy, Carnival's president, told me aboard the ship shortly after it entered service last May. We've added outdoor spaces to places like the Fahrenheit 555 Steakhouse and Bonsai Sushi. The ship offers plenty of outdoor fun too. The Kaleida slide atop the ship is a twisting by 450 foot long inner tube slide. Sky rides bicycle pods suspended from above follow a course high above the ship. Indoors, Vista has the first seagoing IMAX theater, a 187-seat space with a three-deck high screen that shows first-run movies. Vista also has two new stateroom areas. Family Harbor has a lounge with games, snacks, and a big screen TV, and its cabins can accommodate up to five people. Havana staterooms are located near the Havana Bar and Pool, and Havana Cabana rooms have outdoor patios with hammocks. The Red Frog Pub and Brewery, a staple on several carnival ships, has a microbrewery or Vista. Capitalizing on the current craze, research shows that beer has so many benefits, it's no wonder it's gaining in popularity, says brewmaster John Carpenter, who created Vista's microbrewery. And beer from microbreweries offers more flavor than commercially bottled brands. At the Red Frog, a brewmaster gives tours and tables have taps where you can pull your own pint. These innovations, along with Carnival's affordable fares and lack of pretense, illustrated to me that the line's ship remains the best bargain at sea. All right, that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.